Hello, everyone. Uh, we have a great panel here to talk about AI governance more broadly beyond Congress. I'm going to let my panelists introduce themselves, maybe give a line or two on how you use AI in your job or how it applies to your job currently, and then we can go from there. Let's start with you. Thank you, Elham Tabassi. I lead the Trustworthy Responsible AI program at NIST. Uh, I have been with National Institute of Standards and Technology since 1999, uh, working on various machine learning and computer vision um, uh, programs, applications with uh, biometrics. And uh, we just recently released the AI RMF that I think we'll be talking about it today. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Bertram Lee, Senior Policy Counsel for Data Decision Making and Artificial Intelligence with the Future of Privacy Forum. Um, I'm looking at AI regulation across the globe um, at both the state and um, global level. Um, and yeah, that's my daily use of AI, I guess. Evangelos Raziz. Seems to be off. Can you hear me now? Evangelos Raziz with Workday. We are an enterprise software as a service company. Uh, providing enterprise uh, financial management, human resources, and planning software to over half the Fortune 500. Uh, I am the U.S. AI Policy Engagement Lead. My name is Michael Richards. I'm a Policy Director at the Chamber Technology Engagement Center within the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, my day-to-day -day job is to work uh, lead an AI working group of 300 plus members, as well as look at state and local, as well as uh, federal policy. Thank you. Um, I think we will start with the NIST framework. Um, it kind of came out just in time um, a little bit ago when everybody was really talking about generative AI and how it applies to their life. I think some people were surprised to know that NIST had actually been working on this for a while. Um, so can we talk about the framework and why NIST put this together and how it sort of came about and how you see it fitting into this very current conversation about AI? I'm happy to. Uh, so, uh, to your question about why NIST is working on this, uh, NIST has a, a very broad portfolio of research and a, a long-standing tradition of cultivating trust in technology. And we do that by advancing measurement science, advancing technical standards that make technology more robust, secure, private, in other words, more uh, trustworthy. And that's exactly what we are doing in the area of AI through our foundational research, but also, as I said, NIST has a very broad portfolio of research. So our scientists also using AI as a scientific discovery in their research. So we get to see how AI is being used and also work on uh, foundational uh, concepts of what constitutes, constitutes trust and what trustworthy AI looks like. Uh, about the uh, AI RMF, AI Risk Management Framework, uh, directed by a congressional mandate, um, AI or MF is a voluntary framework for managing the risk of AI systems in a flexible, structured, and measurable way. Uh, flexible to, uh, first and foremost, allow for innovation to happen, but also allow for different organizations with different level of resources be able to uh, adopt it and use it. Uh, structured in terms of that, it starts by trying to provide some sort of a, um, a lexicon, you know, unified lexicon and vocabulary about what's AI system, what's the risk of AI systems, how the risk of AI systems differs from uh, the risk of any other uh, information or data systems. And uh, with that sort of lays out why another framework is needed for uh, managing the risk of AI systems. Uh, and it's uh, measurable and that's really uh, near and dear to our heart because if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. So if you really want to improve the trustworthiness of AI systems, uh, any approach for risk management, any approach for understanding the trustworthiness should also provide a metrology for how to measure trustworthiness. Uh, it adopts a rights preserving approach and provide uh, and outlines processes for uh, understanding and measuring traditional measures such as validity, reliability, accuracy, uh, but uh, uh, also importantly acknowledge socio-technical uh, uh, characteristics such as privacy, interpretability, transparency, security, bias, um, and, and uh, outlines uh, processes for understanding and managing them. Uh, these characteristics are uh, tied to human behavior and they cannot be uh, uh, summarized into a single number and be measured with a single threshold. Um, uh, it was released on January 26. Uh, very quickly to answer uh, your questions about 
uh, generative AI. Uh, so, so uh, of course, the ChatGPT, the release of ChatGPT in November captured uh, a lot of attention uh, across the media and everywhere. But, but a lot of us in the AI field were aware of these things, were aware of this uh, generative AI systems. And we were thinking about this. Uh, very quickly, uh, AI or MF, uh, the way it defines AI systems, the definition is definitely applicable to generative AI. It was by design. It was something that we had our eyes on it. Uh, and the second thing is that a risk-based approach is a very powerful approach. Uh, and if it's done correctly, it's also flexible to allow for uh, all of these de different uh, innovations that happen. Uh, well, granted, uh, understanding the risk profile of a generative AI, such as ChatGPT, is going to be a lot uh, more complicated and complex uh, of a risk profile of a um, deep neural net, which is more complicated and complex than a logistic regression. Uh, but at the end, what's important is to have a structured way of understanding risk, a good taxonomy of risks and, and methods and measure to, for measuring them. Uh, if, um, if I have time, I just want to say a few words about uh, AI or MF has been developed in an open, transparent, collaborative process. Uh, it started with a request for uh, information, uh, rounds of workshops, rounds of drafts for public comments. And uh, uh, in the span of 18 months, we heard from more than 240 organizations, receives more than 600 sets of comments. And the, uh, the outreach and engagement was from a tech community to civil society to uh, legal scholars. Uh, uh, on our team, we uh, consulted with uh, psychologists and sociologists. We have cognitive scientists on our, on our, on our team because, again, uh, AI systems uh, is all about context and risk management cannot be done without understanding the context and the, uh, from the socio-technical uh, lens and approach. Thank you so much. I was going to ask you about generative AI and the framework, so thank you for addressing that. Um, my next question is for you three. Um, AI is obviously rapidly advancing. How do you perceive the state of governance today in your organizations in this AI landscape? How are you perceiving how you're using AI and thinking about AI right now? And we can start with um, Richard. So um, I think what we do at Future Privacy Forum is really find the nuance and really just kind of describe where the law and technology meet and where there is not clear clarity. We try to provide best practices and guide firms um, and organizations with the help of civil society, academics, um, and other organizations to be able to build forward as to how to make these technologies safer, um, how to build them in context uh, with data privacy protection principles, um, how to ensure that civil and human rights are part of the conversation, and how to make sure that they're workable. And I think from that perspective, um, what we're seeing right now in the governance space is that um, with the EU AI Act kind of moving forward, we're also seeing states really lead the way. And there are a number of proposals um, both in Connecticut um, California, the New York AI law. Um, I think there's one in Oregon, if I'm not mistaken, don't quote me on that. But there are a number of proposals that are coming out that are asking AI or that are asking organizations that use AI to be more transparent. And I think transparency is going to be the next big wave within AI regulation. Can you cite your work? Can you show your work? Are you willing to have somebody open up and say, this is how we did testing. This is how we did risk management. Uh, this is how we do bias testing. These are all the things that are so incredibly important because the scale of these decisions is what I think scares regulators, policymakers, and people so much. Um, the ability of AI to make thousands and thousands, if not millions of decisions that are really consequential to the lives of people every single day is the thing that has a lot of people really wanting to regulate this space. And honestly, organizations that we talk to want regulation as well. They just want to make sure that regulation is in line with how they're using the tool, in line with risk, and in line with how these concepts and, and in line with their legal liability as it stands right now. And so all of those things are like a, it's a massive dance right now, but it's moving forward in a particular direction at this point. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. The so I think John put it very well earlier, which is these are very complicated issues. And I think folks are figuring out what is the art of the possible at the same time that, um, you know, it, clearly the AI technology is moving at a, at, a, at a certain pace and how can policymakers act in a way that builds trust. And really that's sort of the foundational framework in which uh, Workday views a lot of these AI policy conversations. How do we advance trust? How do we... Uh, you know, in, in enable responsible innovation. And, you know, I think we've seen quite a bit of interest on in policymakers, I think as Bertram had mentioned, 
at the state level, obviously here in, in, in DC and then internationally. Uh, in terms of what specifically I think is within that realm of the possible, it's uh, accounting for the really maturing state of AI governance. Clearly we have the NIST framework, which is really an important step forward in terms of how do, how do organizations operationalize trustworthy AI, but technical standards are very much still in development. Uh, and so what are you uh, looking at in terms of at a very practical level for organizations when it comes to implementing trustworthy AI? A lot of that's still being written. A lot of that foundational work is happening now. And so we try to be constructive partners with policymakers, recognizing the need to do something, uh, recognizing the need to move the ball forward. And you know, for us, I think we arrive at AI impact assessments, which uh, I know is sort of a, a key subject of the, of the panel, uh, differentiating between uh, the different roles in the marketplace that companies play. And then of course, uh, taking a risk-based approach, which you know, will make sure that we are focused on the use cases that present consequential risk to, uh, to users and also aligns us with the EU AI Act, which uh, is, is certainly a key priority for us. Yeah, so us at the US Chamber, um, so first PricewaterhouseCooper put out a uh, study a few years ago that showed that AI has a potential for a $13 trillion increase in GDP globally. Uh, but on top of that, we recently did some uh, polling which showed that small businesses are planning on utilizing AI at a 27% uh, increase within the next year. So within the business community, this is going to happen. People are utilizing artificial intelligence and we need to make sure that uh, the use of AI is going to be trustworthy and developed in a way which mitigates potential issues around it so that the society and in general, we all have trust within the utilization of it. So we've taken that um, first and foremost as our approach to this. And how do we go through that process in working with our companies and members to develop uh, trustworthy AI, be it you know providing comment back to the RF, uh, risk management framework, be it other things that are happening within the federal government, state government as well. But on top of just saying things, uh, the U.S. Chamber actually decided to actually do more than that. So about a year, a little over a year ago, we put together uh, the U.S. Chamber Commission on AI. Uh, two former members of Congress, John Delaney from Maryland, uh, Mike Ferguson from New Jersey, as well as a group of people from academia, uh, business community, as well as, you know, groups such as Brookings Institute, AEI, et cetera, to come around and actually go around the United States and globally to actually look at this issue as far as uh, recommendations, regulations, and ways in which we can approach. And actually, I'm, I'm happy to actually share with you, everyone in this panel, as well as uh, in the outside, that those recommendations are actually going to be coming out this upcoming Thursday. Uh, and we look forward to sharing that with everybody and looking for a bipartisan approach to developing, um, you know, a way forward around this. So this will be the chamber's sort of principles and guidelines on AI for businesses? So this is actually not the chamber's. I, I can't say that this is the chamber funded this as a thought leadership process, uh, but this is more about having a bipartisan way of approaching things that we saw that this being so important that, uh, you know, it was necessary to bring together everybody to allow this to come out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I have a question uh, for Bertram. So uh, with what you've seen come out so far with the NIST framework and the AI principles from the White House, what's your perception on how well they're addressing diversity, inclusion, any worries about how AI can disproportionately discriminate against people of color and women? Um, are we addressing these things in a good way so far and where does more work need to be done? So I would say that there are a couple things that folks need to keep in mind. One, the laws that are on the books right now apply to AI as well, right? So whether you're talking about uh, the context of civil rights laws, uh, Title VII, Title VI, um, whether you're talking about the Fair Housing Act, whether you're talking about ECOA, um, FICRA, um, ADEA, ADA, right? These are all just like a, a smattering of them. There is more, right? These all apply currently to organizations, to firms right now. Um, what there isn't really though, is a great way of thinking about how these tools and how do you test these tools in a way that's equitable. And so for example, I'll give you the example of, um, there are different communities have different contexts about how they want their data used mm -hmm. and how that data should be tested. Mm -hmm. Also, what is the correct test? Are we talking about four-fifths rule? Are we doing statistical significance, right? These are things that regulators need to kind of like coalesce around. And there also needs to be a way to think about 
What is a privacy protective way in order to test for disparate impact across a litany of communities? And how do we ensure that that data is accurate? And how do we make sure that that data actually coalesces around these communities and makes it so that we can do this in a way that is consistent, that is protective of rights, but also is actually doable for companies and for firms across the board. And so that's a conversation that I think is missing right now. And that like, I think civil society, um, us at Future Privacy Forum, folks in, within industry are all trying to have these conversations around where to move those things. And then I think right now there is a real heavy emphasis on bias, but there is not as much about testing and about data. And I think that those conversations are just as important, right? Because in order to figure out how AI is being biased, how AI is potentially discriminating, right? You need to be able to have the right data set, whether that's synthetic or created, right? What do you do? How do people sign up to be part of those data sets? How do people make sure that they're not? All of those things are complicated conversations that we're looking forward to having moving forward. Mm -hmm. And are you is your organization sort of developing best practices or are you talking to lawmakers or NIST specifically about things you would watch out for or providing guidance there? Absolutely. I mean, I think we talk to organizations a lot about best practices. We're developing those around HR and AI, um, look, working with a, a few folks in here um, as well, working with evangelists on those. Um, and so what we're trying to do is figure out what are the best ways to kind of like have organizations or engage in best practices around AI? And also like, what are some of the best recommendations that we can have around these tools and principles? And that is going to manifest itself in a lot of different ways. But, you know, coming from civil society, I'm going to lean towards that direction because yeah. those are the people who I worked with, um, but also folks in an in industry as well and also within pol with policymakers as well. Yeah, I mean, it, it reminds me of the Section 230 debate and other instances where you're not really sure how far the law goes in impacting people until you see a lawsuit or you see something unfold in court. So are you looking to sort of get ahead of that and decide how our current laws apply, apply to AI sort of before you're, you know, just dealing with a lawsuit and that's kind of your only example to look at? Well, I think it depends on who you ask, right? If you ask uh, the civil rights groups, um, whether the law applies, they're going to extend it to what they envision, not only the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law mm -hmm. as well, right? Um, if you ask firms, depending on the firms in the high risk area or not, they're going to kind of limit that to what the court has actually said. Um, but there's a lot of space in between where there's agreement. And that's mm -hmm. what I think we're finding more and more is that folks want to do the right thing. Folks want to engage in these processes um, and be active stakeholders in there and make sure that their products are not discriminating uh, against particular communities or large swaths of communities, because the future of America is one that is a multiracial coalition. And if you're discriminating against your potential future users, potential future clients, right, that's bad business practice. And I think firms, across, all the firms that I've talked to about this completely agree with that mm -hmm. notion and want to be as inclusive as humanly possible. Absolutely. Um, so for Evangelos, the the disc framework is voluntary. It is it's not compulsory by law to follow it. Um, so I know Workday has been really involved in sort of crafting these, and you guys are excited to sort of adopt the guidelines. Other sort of mid sized companies are excited to adopt these guidelines, but they're voluntary. So how do you get the bigger companies excited to sort of look at the NIST framework and say, hey, maybe we should be following some of these principles? How do you get the whole sector? to sort of adopt, at least in spirit, some of these guidelines when it's not in law? Yeah, I would say, let's start with looking at NIST's greatest hits, almost like a good band. Um, <laughs> you know, we start with the cyber, the cybersecurity framework and the privacy framework. Yeah. These have influenced best in class governance programs for both those respective fields. Uh, they're very widely respected uh, in part because NIST runs such an open and transparent process um, and because of its technical expertise. Uh, and so when you describe to a lot of folks who understand these, these governance issues, you never usually have to spell out what NIST means. Mm -hmm. uh, they just, they're, they're familiar with the organization and its products. And so, uh, look, I think part of it is uh, being able to sell the utility of this. Uh, it is a very practical uh, how-to guide for organizations. Uh, for us, it has influenced and will continue to influence how we think about AI governance. Uh, and I think in many ways, the utility of it is going to make it, um, you know, uh, it's not exactly a difficult sell. And so uh, I think part of it is just education, being able to, to speak to others 
uh, about why this is such a valuable tool, how it does advance uh, trustworthiness in AI. Um, and then, you know, again, like any good sort of stakeholder process, invite folks to the table, uh, allow them to share their best practices uh, in how they're using it. And, you know, I think the ambition here is like the cybersecurity framework, uh, seeing the AI framework become the common language in which we're thinking about AI. Because um, I think, Bertram, as you, as you mentioned so eloquently, I think there's, there's a lot of discussions right now on AI. There's a desire to come together around uh, common concerns, uh, common, trying to craft common ways forward. And I, and I think we certainly see the NIST framework as that potential common language because it's already been done in other fields. Michael, do you have any thoughts on that, given that yeah. you're in touch with companies often? <laughs> so, I mean, on top of the large companies, I think, as um, you know, Evangelis was saying, that you know, they're already looking to utilize this. They're already going through the process. Um, I think a lot of other large companies that I've talked to are doing the same thing, to be completely honest with you. I think really where uh, one of the efforts that needs to be done is actually on the small and medium size as well as the C-suite executives, because that's really where you're going to change hearts and minds. One, you know, small businesses, they don't have the resources, uh, to be completely frank with you. They don't have a legal department to, you know, look at this and see how they're utilizing it, you know, track it and look at where they are in their AI life cycle to really go through it. But there needs to be this um, understanding and lexicon as uh, we were just talking about, about these issues and have that, you know, the right questions to ask to go through the process which is something that RMF does a very, very uh, good job about doing. But I think there needs to be also this opportunity for a continued dialogue around it. Um, I think that this is what this is doing right now, be it the playbook, as well as the upcoming profiles. Um, this is 1.0 is the best way I like to say it is not the end of this. It's a living document. It's going to continually be uh, discussed and worked on. And, you know, for us, the U.S. Chamber, we look forward to continuing to work with them. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to talk about Europe for a little bit. So. The AI Act is soon going to go into effect in Europe. Sort of from a high level, how is everyone sort of comparing the U.S. approach so far and what Europe is doing? What are the major differences and similarities? And we can start with you. Okay. Uh, thank you for all of the kind words about the AI or MF. That's, that's really good. Um, and yes, we're committed to, to work on the uh, profiles and, and implementation. And what are these profiles you're talking yeah. about? So um, AI RMF by uh, design is uh, a framework, right? It's, it's uh, technology, use case agnostic, and of course, law and regulation agnostic because we are non-regulatory. Uh, at the same time, I said it, and I all agree that AI is all about context. So if I want to do risk management in, uh, for um, um, you know, an AI systems that uh, look at a uh, scan of the brain uh, 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 image and this makes some, you know, predictions uh, or diagnosis on the image will be different than how we use AI in hiring or how you use AI in different things. So profiles are going to be verticals or tailored set of guidance of the AI RMF for particular use cases. Um, and that is, again, goes back to some of this flexibility that we said we built in. So the AI RMF is, uh, and you ask about uh, the voluntary nature of this, uh, uh, but um, it already had brought a uh, community on a shared understanding of what we mean by AI risks and, and provide that um, um, common lexicon and language, which, which is, I think, the first step mm -hmm. on whatever else we want to do. First, we want to know what, what is we're talking about. Okay, uh, about the EU, um, uh, so uh, their approach is also a risk-based approach, but there are uh, similarities and differences be, uh, among the two uh, approaches. Um, Trade and Technology Council, uh, uh, it was um, one of the deliverables that came out on December 5 was a joint AI roadmap, uh, which is uh, focused on understanding the similarities, understanding the gap and, and figure out what can be done over the you know, two sides of the Atlantic uh, to understand those gaps and get to, uh, uh, you know, bring, bridge the gap to the extent possible. Uh, in the AI RMF, we have also provided some crosswalks. One of them, uh, one of those crosswalks, uh, talks about how the trustworthiness characteristics in the AI RMF uh, maps to or relate to um, um, the concepts in the EU AI Act, but also OECD AI recommendation. And uh, we try to leverage all of the work that has been done. Um, you said that it's going to come to effect really soon. Uh, the, you know, really soon is a little bit objective term. It's still uh, some uh, way ahead. Uh, my personal belief is that 
regardless of the regulatory and policy landscape, having good, um, solid, you know, scientifically valid, technically solid international standards that talk about risks, that talk about risk management, talk about trustworthiness, uh, can be a good backbone and a common ground for all of these uh, uh, regulations and policy uh, discussions. And that is uh, our job, that is NIST's job to provide those type of technical contribution on the, to the table for con the conversation. Happy to weigh in. Um, I think a lot of what Elham said is so important because it enables technical interoperability between the emerging approach here in the US and the AI Act. Um, you know, Workday has been watching the AI very closely, engaging, again, trying to be constructive and building bridges between uh, what is happening in Europe uh, and, and obviously uh, sort of the emerging AI governance approach here in the US. Um, the importance of standards here, I think just it's important maybe just to kind of dig in a little bit, and this is what differentiates uh, us from the Europeans. Uh, the Europeans can legislate, and generally when they say they're going to legislate, there, there is legislation. They really uh, they, they, yeah. There will be an AI Act, we know that for certain. Uh, and so uh, they will then turn to their standards development organizations and, and ask them to fill in the blanks. Um, that is generally not how the U.S. has approached uh, mm -hmm. technical standards. Uh, there is a more um, uh, market-driven or sort of bottoms-up approach to standards development. Uh, and so there's uh, a lot of interest in once the AI Act uh, is enacted into law, uh, getting those standards in place uh, at a time when uh, a lot of this is being built from the ground up. Uh, I think this has sort of uh, been a, a challenge as we sort of view in the U.S. in terms of, again, what is the art of the possible in advancing AI in a way that recognizes that te those technical standards are still in development. Uh, and so it's one of the reasons why we're, we're so much in favor of impact assessments, because they don't rely on technical standards, even though uh, I think, as Elham put there, good standards will always, will, will always be helpful in, in terms of good organizational practices. Uh, and so this is certainly a space that we're watching. Uh, we think there's a lot of potential in the AI Act to become a global benchmark. Uh, I mean that positively. Cool. Uh, and uh, certainly we're, we're watching the space very closely and, and eagerly uh, seeing the uh, good work coming out of the TTC. If either of you want to address Europe? <laughs> I think one of the things that um, gets missed in the conversation between US and Europe is that um, while there are differences in how we think about bias and how we think about like, you know, we use the term marginalized communities in the US. Um, in the EU, they use the term vulnerable communities and um, there are different standards in which they kind of like constitute those. But if you look at kind of like the totality of civil rights law that I basically blurted out previously, and also the EU Human Rights Convention and the UN Convention on, uh, on Human Rights, they map almost the same. Mm -hmm. um, not perfect one-to-one, -one, but mostly they map on pretty similarly when it comes to protected classes. And so that also kind of like manifests itself in how the EU AI Act thinks about high risk activity. Again, not perfect, but it's almost a one-to-one -one about what you currently cannot do within the context of um, the US when it comes to like what activities we think of as protected. Mm -hmm. We, they're in different laws, they may be in different standards, they're not necessarily all considered quote unquote high risk activity. Um, they're covered by a, a milliage or a deluge of laws, right? But like, though they're very similar. And so like, I think there's not as much of a delta in between okay. like how we think about this. Um, and I think that's something that we miss in this conversation as well. Yeah, the one thing I would add to this is actually, you know, look, the U.S. Chamber has a lot of concerns regarding the EUAI Act and its current state. Um, but the one thing they did get right is risk-based. Where something that we're seeing right now in the United States is the ADPPA, the American Data Privacy Protection Act, uh, and specifically Section 207, is really not a risk-based approach. Um, they put consequential risk in there, but that is a defined term for FTC to define, not actually uh, Congress. We would ask Congress to define that term so that we make sure, as well as uh, the requirement to submit impact assessments through that provision is actually a uh, may for the FTC, not a shell for uh, actual risk base. So impact assessments, that's addressed in the ADPPA, as you just said. What exactly, in very simple terms, is, is a risk assessment and how does it apply to an AI application? Anybody who wants to answer, <laughs> go ahead. I cited it enough times, so I'm on the hook yes. to, to define it. Um, 
So an impact assessment is a tool to help organizations identify, document, and this is an important doc document, and, and address risks associated with technology. And so it is, uh, notice I didn't use the word AI in that definition because they're already used in other contexts like data protection or privacy. Uh, under GDPR, for example, you're required uh, to carry out a data protection impact assessment. Under several state laws, it is required to carry out a, a privacy impact assessment of some form, although the requirements differ from uh, depending on the state. And so um, it is a very valuable tool to help organizations take a holistic view of the technology before it goes into the marketplace or before it is used. Uh, so we, we think it's a, a really valuable uh, uh, approach to address some of the risks around AI, uh, a necessary step forward as a lot of the technical standards are being developed. I will give a shout out. Uh, so we released a paper along with Access Partnership on the role of impact assessments. Uh, and for those who have may have seen our, our little card, uh, there's a QR code where you can get access uh, to that and learn, learn more. And when it comes to impact assessments, just to kind of like address two things at once. One, I think 207 actually works as a public accommodation space. Um, we currently have that in law as well. A business has already have to comply with public accommodations laws and as it stands right now. Um, 207 is more of a digital public accommodations law. And that is, I think, important to keep in context because it reminds businesses and it reminds firms that you have to include everyone in how you design tools and make sure that you're not discriminating or at least attempt to not discriminate. And impact assessments are a way in which to codify that. Here's what we're trying to do. Here's how we're thinking about it. Here's how we're trying to at least address some of these issues. And I think 207 at ADPA does that. And I think where impact assessments start is that we're developing technical standards right now. We're working towards that, but there isn't necessarily a common language that we have quite yet. Mm -hmm. Then as we develop that, let's at least try. It, it's the same context of like, let us try to get these things right. Let us try to get, um, be as inclusive as we possibly can, um, mm -hmm. as kind of like was stated earlier, like this, this is an administration priority. Be as inclusive in the economy as humanly possible. It makes all of us stronger. And that's the context of technology, allowing us to actually be, uh, buy into the idea and the, con the concept that all of us collectively, when we work together and we all have access to these tools, we can build a better and greater thing, a build a better and greater society, build a better and greater internet, build better and greater tools, right? That's all 207 is trying to do in that context. And I think then impact assessment piece is so critical. For and so like when, <laughs> and my, at a previous role when we were working on that section, that was the whole concept behind it. And I think that there is, you know, pushback against it. And I think that some of it's valid, but I think uh, the broad context of what that pushback comes from is not necessarily from the public accommodations or the broader kind of context of like allowing more people inside of the technology, allowing more people to participate in the digital economy. It's about how we do it. Mm -hmm. And so like, as we're working forward, let's make sure that we keep that in mind, that we want everyone to be able to participate in this new digital economy. And that's like, I think a really key point for not only policymakers, mm -hmm. but it's true in the EU, it's true in South America, it's becoming true in the APAC region, it's going to be true in Africa. The whole world understands that concept. And let's not be the one who lags behind as America. If I can go very quickly, underscore something really important that Evangelos and from you several times point to that. Um, the importance of assessments, uh, but also the importance of having a good understanding of uh, what to measure and how to measure uh, metrics, methodologies, test data that can do that. And I think that is something that, uh, particularly from the socio-technical uh, angle, uh, is a challenge for the whole tech and science and research community. Uh, I usually say that for an agency of 120 years of history of uh, running bench benchmark and evaluations, we have uh, perfected the art and science of technical evaluations and technology evaluations. But when it comes from um, uh, measuring uh, technology from the viewpoint of, is it working for everybody? Uh, is AI systems is uh, benef benefiting all people in equitable, responsible, fair way? Uh, there is uh, major technical challenges that I think uh, I, uh, a, a lot of really good scientists and research communities working on that. And I think that's something really important. 
So let me ask you just sort of about a real world example right now. Microsoft released uh, Bing's chat GPT sort of not to the public to select amount of Bing users and on a rolling basis. And their point of view going into that was, hey, maybe this isn't fully ready yet, but we really want to see how people are using it, the sort of feedback they're getting, some of the flaws people are pointing out. That helps us learn. That helps us make the product better. Now, I, on first impression, I wouldn't think that's like a traditional, you know, impact assessment exercise. That seems a little different to me. Is is that a is that an example of that? Is that a little more public than these should be? How how do you feel about that approach, you know, compared to what you guys just described, which is obviously a very methodical sort of rolled out thing? So I won't comment on Microsoft or Microsoft te technology, or I might end up uh, complaining about, about Teams. Um, but <laughs> well, we can't um, have that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I I, I will say uh, this this goes a little bit back toward kind of the risk based approach and why I think ChatGPT has has interested so many in AI governance, which is um, you know we're talking about sort of a use case specific approach to you know focusing resources attention uh, by organizations by by government and policymakers on you know specific uses of a tool, and I think you know some of the questions that have arisen around ChatGPT has been uh, broader you know, non-use case specific uh, applications of, of, of AI. And, um, I and think is that because people are sort of just throwing stuff at it and seeing how it responds and, and not really any uniform way? I, I, you know, that is, that is a good question. Um, you know, I, I, I myself am, I'm still, uh, I think uh, under, under trying to understand the, uh, the implications of it, but yeah. I think El Elham put it well, which is, uh, you know, you can still use tools that we're talking about now uh, to try to understand and, and address uh, the risks uh, associated with any AI technology, including specific use cases of generative AI. If I can pick up, so, um, so um, the ARRMF put a lot of emphasis on test evaluation, verification, and validation. And uh, also talks about risk management being a shared responsibility across the whole life cycle of AI, which also talks about life cycle. Um, and uh, in the um, uh, uh, guidance that it provides and in the playbook, uh, talks specifically about the role of develop designers, developer, deployers, tester on along all of these lines. Um, and, and again, evaluation and measurement are extremely important is exactly where the rubber hits the road on understanding risks and uh, doing the risk management. Um, a, it's, uh, it's important when this type of testing is being done that the impacted community are identified uh, so that the uh, magnitude of the impact can also be measured. Evangelos talks about participatory design making sure that they, it, there is an uh, inclusive reach to the people that get the test that, uh, you know, are involved in uh, whatever the role of the AI actor is. So um, it's, it cannot be, uh, uh, you know, overemphasized the importance of doing the right verification and validation before putting this type of products out. When they are out, they are out with all of their risks mm -hmm. there, right? So... So the things that we just put it out and tested as people are using it is is not a very good uh, risk-based approach. Yeah, I don't think, you know, sort of letting people use it and see what happens is exactly what you guys have in mind. <laughs> That's the best practice. Um, we can end here on China. Um, a lot of lawmakers seem to be motivated by this idea that we need to regulate AI with our American principles to keep up with China. Um, so is that a good motivator? Is that how lawmakers should be thinking about this? And how are you guys thinking about sort of the global competition aspect here, especially with China? And we can start with you. Sure. Um, obviously, China has their 2030 plan uh, and they have stated that be it standardization, be it, um, you know, AI regulation, be it um, everything they want to be a part of and they want to lead in by 2030. So obviously, it's something that our policymakers um, are looking at and have to address. I think that uh, this would be another great opportunity for me to plug the AI Commission's report that's coming out this Thursday that actually has a national security piece to it. 
Um, and I think that those would provide lawmakers uh, something to go off of as far as uh, starting principles around it. Thank you. I think your question speaks to getting the balance right, which is how do we address these issues of public concern uh, in a meaningful way while also enabling responsible innovation and enabling companies that want to do the right thing and are doing the right thing to do so. And so uh, I think certainly that question draws it into starker light. Um, I also think it speaks to the importance of having consistent policymaking. There are certainly concerns uh, around, as we've seen in privacy, uh, you know, uh, states uh, acting. I think uh, there, there are some concerns around a patchwork and around inconsistent uh, requirements between uh, different states as well as here in, in, uh, in D.C. And so having, again, a kind of common language, uh, common way of thinking about uh, AI and addressing those issues of, of public trust without unduly uh, burdening responsible innovation. Correct. I mean, both. I think I would just say that the strength of what we do is when we include more people inside of the process and in ensuring that our tools work for as many people as possible. Um, if we're talking about kind of like the global AI context, uh, making sure our AI actually does work for the globe. Mm -hmm. um, the globe is not full of white people. The mm -hmm. globe is full of a multiracial coalition of humans who are trying to engage and participate in the digital economy in a varying context. Ensuring that our AI works for the world is critical. And in doing so, that means protecting human rights, that means protecting civil rights, that means doing testing, that means thinking about fairness, that means thinking about how we frame up um, our responsible risk management practices. Those are all critical in order to keep us at the highest level of competition because that's how Silicon Valley started. It started in the Bay because of the diverse array of people who were around there. And also it, was, it helped fuel and funnel the digital economy and fuel technology as we know it right now. Do you have anything to add? Uh, I'll just take it back to the AI RMF and say that uh, the ultimate goal, the bigger goal of the AI RMF, as I said, is to cultivate trust in technology, is to operationalize values in the technology, design and build technologies that are reflective of the values of our society. And, and we don't want this to be an after fact. We want this, we want this uh, proactive thinking about how to build technologies that are reflective of our values and work for all people, again, in a, in a equitable, responsible, fair way uh, uh, in, as part of the design development of technology. Thank you. Well, thanks to all of you for a great and fascinating conversation. With that, that's our time. So thanks for tuning in.